Welcome back, Chappelle. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom and our continuing discussion of ancient Rome. I love this unit. So now look, the biggest thing about it that you need to understand though really, really quick is I'm about to clip in an old flip that I recorded last year, okay? Some of you are like, why would you do that, Mr. Terry? Well, the thing about it is it's one of my most highly viewed flips I've ever made. Literally, I made it last year and posted it and it got somewhere in the neighborhood of like 500, 600 views on it. So tons of people that aren't even my students we're watching it and getting a lot out of it. So it's like, what's the point in reinventing the wheel if you don't have to, right? It's really, really good. The information in it is absolute money, right? Like I actually like flow really well. All the stuff gets done very, very well. So I just want y'all to go ahead and try to watch that and jot some things down and we'll talk about it a little bit later. And you can literally see how good it is by the way I introduced this. Like, look how much I love Rome. Rome, oh, like I love this unit so cringy and weird i know but still anyway okay so do me a favor go ahead and watch this oh also real real quick big shout out though i gotta tell all y'all you did great with that pre-assessment love doing it epier i know you haven't done it quite yet but okay but the thing about it is, is we'll see what y'all score in general but big shout out c period c period crushed it the other day and if i didn't say something nice about y'all i think samantha was gonna come and punch me so the big thing about it though is y'all did an absolutely great job with that pre-assessment c period is currently in the lead with 30 points and the big thing about it is we'll see what he can do and if they can measure you're up, all right? But I'll see y'all soon. Y'all have a good one. So much. Geography of ancient Greece is just distinctly different from the geography of ancient Italy, right? So ancient Greece and ancient Italy's geography was exactly opposite of one another, right? We know that ancient Greece is very mountainous, whereas Italy was not. It was actually much more flat and rugged. We know that Greece had a ton of harbors. We know that Italy did not. It's cliffs on the edge of like the entire like perimeter of the, what you call it, on the coastline, right? Which is going to defend Italy from early things like that. We know that uh, ancient Greece's geography is going to make them trade a lot, whereas Romans are not going to do that. And a lot of that actually is branching off of a couple of other things, right? We left off in class talking about, though, how the Greeks had already colonized the few natural harbors that actually Italy even had. This area down here in southern Italy, which is the kingdom of the two Sicilies and Sicily as well, was already colonized by ancient Greece, right? As we can see, Athens and Sparta had already set up little areas all over the place. Now, this is going to distinctly affect the uh, Romans going forward after they've already been founded. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on because they're going to have very, very uniquely somewhat kind of Greek things in their culture, right? But going into it, another really big Greek thing that we remember from learning about ancient Greece is that ancient Greece's farmland was hot garbage, right? Like it was awful. It was only like 20% farmable land. You could only really grow like grains, grapes, olives there. Italian farmland, on the other hand, is fantastic, right? They had a large percentage of farmable land that was very, very good. And you could just take a seed and stick it in the dirt in Italy and yaga, and like something's gonna grow, right? And to this day, Italy has very, very good farmland. Great for growing massive areas of grains and grapes. And some of you are like, they grew that in Greece too. Shut up, all right? So like the other big thing they can grow is like lemons, citrus, fruits, vegetables, and all these other things throughout the entirety of the Italian peninsula, and it's beautiful. But really quickly, why? I hear Dublin over there in the corner be like, why, Mr. Terry? But why, for example, or why is Italy's farmland so much worse than Greece's farmland, right? Well, or no, wait, other way around. Why is Italy's farmland so much better than Greece's farmland? Well, a lot of it has to do with two chemicals that are actually inside of Italy's farmland that make it very farmable, or very, like, farmable, right? And those two things are volcanic ash and the silt that's in the river right so Italy had a ton of different oh geez so like had a ton of different oh, God, I cut that out so Italy had all these different items inside of their soul right now some of y'all are like oh well, wait a minute Mr. Terry how's volcanoes gonna affect them well th check this out okay so we were talking about this in B period and I remember some kids were like well isn't Pompeii like a city well that was a Roman city different volcano there's a volcano to the north of Rome that is gonna actually expel ash and different dusts and stuff like that whenever it would erupt and this is gonna end up in the waters and the river and then on the soil as well the mountain is literally called like Mount Stromboli right like, so like now volcanic ash though is full of tons of nutritional benefits for the soul, like nitrogen and carbon and all these other different items. And uh, what's the other big one? Nitrogen is the biggest one out of all of them that actually are going to replenish the soul and make it very, very good for growing things, right? And then also a lot of that volcanic ash is going to get mixed into the water of the rivers, right? And the rivers are going to have this really thick layer of mud on the bottom that's going to be called silt. For any of y'all that have ever actually been swimming in a river before and you've ever like stuck your hand down to the bottom of the river and you try to pull it up and then it just goes like, sigh, like it like just kind of thins out through your hands it's like so fine and like like so 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 well ground up that it's just like so thin you can't even bring it over the water right that stuff 
is silt, right? Silt is from the bottom of rivers and it's made of mud and rock and dirt and decomposing animals and dead like plant matter and all this other stuff. And so it's a great fertilizer as well. And the river that Rome was founded right next to would flood every single year and it would leave behind tons of silt on the farmland and actually make it so the soil was really, really rejuvenated, right? So the thing about it is these things would give Rome tons of great farmland that was makes it very, very easy for them to farm a ton of stuff to feed their society, right? And also, here's another big thing. Not only is Italy protected on their coastline by cliffs that drop off into the water, but they're also protected by two different mountain ranges, right? There are two different mountain ranges that protected fledgling Rome when it was being founded from attack from outsiders and things like that. And those two different mountain ranges include the following ones. One is called the Apennines, not the Appalachian, you weirdos, all right? Those are in America. And you can actually see the Apennines just a little bit right through here, right? They actually run north to south along Italy. And little baby Rome was right here, protected on the eastern or the eastern side by the Apennine Mountains. And then these mountains up here are the ones that I got to go and see, actually, this entire weekend when I was there. And I'll show a couple of pictures of those real quick. Yes, as you can see, those beautiful like, Alps that are actually north of Lake Como where I was and stuff like that. The Alps are a massive set of mountains that actually protected Italy from the north and prevented other people from coming in and invaded Italy directly from the north, right? So the Alps and the Apennines that actually like are going to keep little baby Rome safe. Now, speaking of little baby Rome, we got to know something real quick, okay? Before we go any further, you need to understand something very, very important. There are three time periods in ancient Rome, right? There are not eight, there's not seven, there's not all these other like huge numbers of time periods like we've talked about before. There's just three, right? The following three time periods are very important, okay? And it goes the kingdom period, which is the shortest out of all of them, the republic period, and the empire period, okay? The republic and the empire are about the same in length, right? But it's the kingdom, the republic, and the empire, right? And the same again, kingdom, republic, R-E-P-U-B-L-I-C, an empire period, right? So the kingdom period starts off in about 759, 739 BC with the founding of Rome by two brothers, right? So here's the whole thing, all right? When we get into the kingdom period, before we go any further, something you need to understand from about 759 BC when Rome was founded to about, give or take, like 500 BC, circa 500 BC, Rome is going to be a kingdom led over by kings, ruled over by different kings, and there's only going to be seven of them, right? So seven kings would rule over Rome in their earliest time period, right? Now the thing about it, though, is the very first king of Rome relates back to their founding myth, right? There is a myth that relates to the founding of Rome and its very first king, the guy who would start all of Rome and grow them into this massive civilization that would take over the entire continent of Europe and impact literally us on our daily lives, right? Like, so now the big thing about it getting into it, though, is some of y'all might know a little bits and pieces about this myth, right? And I'm not going to tell you the whole myth. I'm going to tell you the whole myth when we're in class because I don't want you to have to sit here and just stare at the statue and then listen to me talk for that long, right? But the big thing about it, so go ahead and write that down. Be like, founding myth. Very important. Tell them to tell us the rest of the story. But the myth of Rome's founding relates to two twin brothers, right? Two twin brothers, and numbers are also very important in Rome because they repeat themselves all the time throughout their culture, right? But two twin brothers would found Rome, and their names were the following. Romulus, R-O-M-U-L-U-S, and Remus, right? So Romulus and Remus were apparently, to give you the short version of the myth, abandoned as young children on the edge of a very important river, which we'll talk about here in a second, right? They were abandoned on the edge of this river where they would be saved and nurtured back to health by a she-wolf named Lupa, who took them and adopted them and kept the babies from dying, right? Later on, a, a, a shepherd would find them and raise them as their own children and stuff like that. But later on, after a very crazy, like, actually, story that I'll tell you in class, Romulus and Remus would go out because they wanted to found a city of their own, right? And so they strike out to find and found this city, and in the long run, they find an area that's got seven hills, right? Seven. Remember, numbers are important when you're talking about Rome because they repeat themselves throughout everything, right? But they found seven hills, just like there were seven kings in ancient Rome, right? So the seven hills was where they ended up founding it, and they founded their city on top of this one in particular, right? Named Palantine Hill. But the thing about it, getting into it, long story short, Romulus and Remus got into a huge fight with each other, 
and apparently Romulus stabbed Remus and became the first king of Rome. Now, like, the big thing about it, though, in general, all right, is that you need to understand this concept that this founding myth relates to a she-wolf and two twin babies that were abandoned on the side of a river and stuff like that. But like I said, we'll talk about that in class because it's a really long story and it's really, really intense, right? But the real founding of Rome probably relates back to something a little bit more simple, right? Now, we do believe that Romulus was a real person. We just don't know if necessarily Remus was a real person. We don't know if he actually stabbed him or not and, like, all this other stuff. But we do believe that the very first king of ancient Rome was this person named Romulus. And he would be followed later on by six other kings before they established this thing known as the Republic, right? Now, the real founders of Rome, though, were likely this little group of people called the Latins, right? The Latins may have been led by the real Romulus, right? Or the real Romulus might not have ever even existed because it is a myth to keep in mind, right? But the thing about it was is apparently according to our archaeological data we know that a gr uh, like a group of people called the latin showed up at the base of seven hills and began to found a city on top of these seven hills right and the very, very old ruins at the top of Palatine Hill, we believe, actually contains the ancient site of where Romulus's hut was. Now, speaking of huts, this is what the Latin huts looked like. Now, they literally were made out of simple clay, mud, and, like, sticks and stuff like that, and they were called wattle and daub, right? Like, so wattle and daub huts started out very, very simple, and some of you are like, Rome doesn't look that intense. Well, give them a minute. They're just being founded, right? They're just being founded in a series of, like, mud huts on top of some hills, right? So, seven hills to be specific. Now, the big thing about it, though, is this small group is going to break away from the Latins eventually and would found the city that would be now called Rome, right? And so those people would become Romans, right? And the Romans now spoke Latin because they're called the Latins because it's the language that they spoke, right? Now, the thing about it in general, which is a funny little thing, like I said, we believe that we have remains or archaeological remains of Romulus's original hut that looked a lot like this. And a funny little thing about ancient Romans when they were actually originally being founded is that when you would die, they would actually burn your body and put you inside of like a little miniature version of your hut. And that's where you would actually be put to death and stuff like that, which is really, really funny because it would take your dead body, they would burn it, they'd shove it in an urn that looked exactly like your house. I think that's hilarious. I want to be shoved in a little box that looks exactly like my house because it's like you're living forever in your little hut, right? So now look, but the big thing about it though is that's the ancient version of the Romans, right? Back all the way into the seven, the like 700s BC, right? But getting into it and moving further, those founders, these Latins that built these simple huts and started the kingdom period, and we believe were led by their original king named Romulus, right? We don't know if Remus was real. We don't know if he actually stabbed him or not. We don't know if they actually were saved by a wolf. I really hope they were. The wolf's name was Lupa. L-U-P-A, by the way. Make sure you have that written down. Now, the thing about it, though, is the real founders that broke away from the Latins would have founded themselves on a hill overlooking Tiber River. That original one, that Palatine one, that actually, like, Romulus, we believe, might have stabbed Remus on top of, right? Rome was founded on that hill overlooking a very important river known as the Tiber River, right? And this is a picture of the Tiber River that I actually took when I went to Rome with my wife in November of 2017, right? And you can see really, really quickly, we went in November, which is actually when the waters are very, very muddy because that's all the silt being churned up and stuff like that due to the influx of snow coming off of the Alps and stuff like that. But every spring, they would actually flood really heavily and leave all that silt, all this mud and stuff like that all over the banks of the rivers, right? And this right here is actually my wife doing a handstand right here. Where is she at? Yep, that's my wife doing a handstand on one of the hills of Rome, which is really, really cool, right? One of those seven hills, which is really, I think she's on Esquiline Hill is what it's called. Now, Ty the Tiber River, though, is going to have this, like, very, very good agricultural water. It's going to help them grow a lot of things, and the settlement is going to continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and to the point where it would cover seven different hills, right? It would help protect them from the floods in the Tiber River, and even later on, the Romans would actually build walls next to the Tiber River so they could use a very all-important area known as the Forum, which we'll talk about that a little bit later on, right? Now, the big thing about it, though, is this right here is the map of the seven hills of ancient Rome, right? The first one, of course, being this one right here, Palatine Hill, and this settlement would eventually spread over this entire area, right? And they had a little marketplace center right down here of the Forum, which is going to become very important. It's like the Greek version of the Agora, right? But nearby, there was another group of people. Now, this is going to become very important because in early ancient Roman history, like I told you, there were seven kings of ancient Rome, right? Seven kings of Rome during the kingdom period, the first one being Romulus. Then there were three Three more of them that would have been considered Roman, right? But then there were three other kings that were called Etruscan kings. That's right, there is a group of people that was just right north of ancient Rome 
that decided that they wanted to pick a fight, right? The Etruscans are going to show up during the Kingdom period, around 400, not 400 BC, around 600 BC-ish, right around like 600 BC, and they're going to take over ancient Rome, and they're going to establish themselves now as the ruling power, right? So the Etruscans, who are a little bit north, come in and tank o take over little fledgling tiny Rome, right? Little baby Rome. They take over and they created city-states to the north of Rome and they start spreading their different cultural influence to the Romans, right? Now the Etruscans that took over Rome for a small period of time during their kingdom period are going to trade a lot with the Greeks, right? They're going to trade a ton with the Greeks and that means that the Etruscans are going to experience what now? Cultural diffusion, that's exactly right, Emma Alvarado, very good job, right? So like, and then that means that the Etruscans are going to do things that are distinctly kind of Greek, right? Like, for example, look at the laurel wreaths on top of their, like, hat, or on top of their heads. Greeks would wear them when they won the Olympics, right? Look at the musical instruments. Look at the olive plants right here. That as comes from after the Etruscans trade with the Greeks and they start picking up some different Greek things. The Etruscans learn a lot about the Greek religion, okay? They do all these different things. But then when Etruscans take over Romans, they're going to leave behind some of these different cultural things in the Romans as well, right? They're going to come up with the walls that build around Rome. They're the ones that originally build, like, literally the walls that, like, protected Rome from different floods and stuff like that. And they're going to rule Rome from anywhere from between about, like, that date is actually wrong. Actually wrong. Ignore the seven. They're going to rule Rome up to 509 BC, right? Before the Romans actually eventually kick them out, which is a really, really good story. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Now, the big thing about it, though, in general, is that while the Etruscans are ruling over Rome for over 100 years, different cultural things that are distinctly Etruscan are going to leak their way into early kingdom period Rome and their society, right? The Romans would expel the Etruscans eventually in 509 BC under the rulership of, again, two men who would show up and expel the last Etruscan king, this guy named Tarquinus Superbus, who literally means like the arrogant one, right? So the Romans, after being led by those two men, would look around and realize, oh, wait, we do a lot of Etruscan things, right? And that's completely fine. The Etruscans like, left three very distinct cultural impacts on Rome that you would think are actually Roman, but they were actually Etruscan at first, right? Most of the things they did were pretty Etruscan, right? For example, you need to write down these three big Etruscan things that affected the Romans. The Greek alphabet is the one that the Etruscans use. It then became the Roman alphabet, right? So the alphabet is very, very important. Another big thing as well is the fashion statement done by the Etruscans. Togas were an Etruscan thing that they had learned from, like, the Greeks and their tunics and stuff like that. And the Etruscans wore togas. They took over the Romans for a little while. And so Romans started wearing togas too, right? Mostly the wealthy wore togas anyway. And then another super important one this thing right here. You need to write this word down. Etruscans had come up with a symbol that would forever be known as a Roman symbol of power, right? You need to make sure you know it. You need to jot this down. It's so ridiculously important. The thing right there in front of you, these wooden rods around an axe that the Etruscans used to symbolize the power of a ruler, right, is known as a fasces, right? F a S C E S, a fascist, right? Now, a fascist is a great piece of, the, like, a thing that was used by Etruscans when they would walk in front of a king, right? The king would stand behind them, and a man would walk in front of them with this thing, this axe with wooden rods around it, right? And it was a symbol of the ruling power of Etruscan kings, right? It was a symbol of the people being represented by the wooden rods and the ruling authority of the government represented by the axe itself, right? It's a symbol of strength and unity that only rulers of Etruscan societies and later rulers of Rome would actually carry with them, right? And actually, what's crazy is you can see this symbol all over our government because we have ripped off the Roman government for so many different things. Like, check this out. Look, Senate, wait, crap. There we go. Senate Hall, fascist U.S. All right, so like the Senate Hall in Washington, D.C., the chamber that our government meets inside of in our Senate Hall literally has two gigantic, beautiful gold fascists on the back of the wall right there. Don't tell me Roman stuff isn't important. And they've got ionic columns to represent the Greek democracy that we use as well. We literally use so many things that are ancient Greek and ancient Roman that affect us on a daily basis, right? And look at this olive branch that's supposed to represent peace that is winding around this fascist right here. And oh, there are two of them, right? Oh, 
two Romulus Remus, Consuls of Rome, two guys that take over all of Rome, and then end up against the Belgian Etruscans. Ah, there's a lot of twos in there, right? So now the big thing about it, though, in general, is remember, numbers are very important when you're talking about ancient Rome. Now, so going into it, though, as well, this fascist symbol would then later on go on to represent the Republic of Rome as well, right? Because when they expelled the Etruscan kings, they took the fascists, and they made a second one, right? And the two leaders of Rome later on, we'll talk about them in a little bit, are called consuls, but actually carry them with them to symbolize their power, right? Now, the thing about it as well that you need to understand is that going forward, you're going to realize that the Etruscans had a dramatic effect. The Romulus Remus story has a dramatic effect. The Seven Hills have a dramatic effect. And we'll talk about all that stuff in class, right? But you're also going to see this other really interesting thing happen when Rome starts expanding and conquesting Italy, right? So there's this interesting little thing also going back to the story of Romulus and Remus, right? So apparently Romulus started a trend of every time a nearby neighbor, like, like for example, the Sabines are the ones that he fought against, would be growing a little bit in power. Rome was well known for going off and trying to like take over those little areas, right? So the Roman conquest of Italy after they take over the Etruscans and beat those guys out, expel them from their city, the Romans are going to start doing something distinctly very Roman. They're going to start getting into a lot of fights with a lot of people nearby them, right? And now this is going to really pop up another thing in their culture as well because they're going to fight several small wars and conquer several small areas around them as they continue to expand, right? So Rome is going to start moving throughout most of Italy and taking over little villages nearby, right? And as they conquered these original areas, they're going to get into a distinctly important thing, right? Like so... And that's the story of Cincinnatus, right? So basically what happened was, this is another Roman cultural thing, right? That 200 years in the kingdom period, which is what we're talking about, is just the Roman culture stuff, is that whenever they would go out and have to have a war or a fight or battle against somebody, it would be ridiculous to sit here and think that the early Rome, founded by Romulus, and founded by the Latins, and like all the ancient, ancient Rome, that was just these little tiny little cities that were smaller than the Minoans and then the Mycenaeans of ancient Greece, it would be silly to think that they just won every one of these battles, like outright, right? And there was a really important one that happened when this Rome went up against this group of people known as the Akai, right? The Akai was another group of people nearby that if they had beaten Rome in this war, we might be talking about them right now instead. But Rome is going to eventually end up winning because they're going to do something very bold and daring, right? Romans realized in their early fledgling state, at the very early part of their society, that if they go out and keep trying to take over people, right, they sometimes need to not be led by two people, but by one, right? And so the idea of Rome going to war established a cultural idea of electing a person known as a dictator, right? So the dictator of ancient Rome, the very first dictator of ancient Rome, was a man by the name of Cincinnatus, right? So what had happened was, is apparently little Rome is going up against these people called the Akai, right? And they're losing, and they're on the verge of death, right? And they're about to lose this massive war, but there was a man that was a farmer that lived out in the countryside, right? And he used to be a phenomenal Roman general, and his name was Cincinnatus, right? And they ran up to Cincinnati and they're like, Cincinnati, Cincinnati, sir, we know you were so experienced in the military and you were so genius and smart and you were so like connected to the ancient roots of Romulus and things like that. We need you to lead us. We need you to lead our armies and we will give you full power over the city of Rome while you're leading us in this war. Cincinnati, who was just a simple farmer and had retired from the military by this point, looked down at his plow, looked up at the men who came to ask for help, wiped sweat off of his brow and went off to fight this war for the Roman people, right? And he led Rome to a dramatic victory, right? And he became what is known as the dictator. And he took over Rome, and he literally was basically like their king. But here's the really interesting thing. This is why he's a dictator and not a king. After the war ended, Cincinnati can be seen right here giving the fascists back to the people of Rome. That is an important thing when we're talking about Roman culture, right? Is that when they were led during war, they were led by one guy, a dictator. But it was always expected that when that war ended, within six months, the man would return the power back to the people and back to the Republic of Rome. And that's why, literally, Cincinnati is handing his fascists back in this statue. And also, fun fact, Cincinnati, Ohio is named after Cincinnati, the Roman dictator. Yeah, again, don't tell me that this stuff is not important. Because guess who plays in Cincinnati, Ohio for the Bengals now? Uh-huh, yeah, that guy that all y'all were in love with for so long, right? Joe Burrow, right? 
And the big thing, though, that we got to talk about in next class, because I don't want to confuse you too much, is we got to talk about why Rome is going to become such a military power and dominance, right? And we're going to talk about the Gallic invasion that happened during the Kingdom period as well, or towards the end of the Kingdom period, when I see y'all in class, right? So go ahead and jot this down. We'll talk about how like Rome's going to continue to fight some wars and stuff like that. But I'll see y'all soon. Y'all have a good one.